Okay. Okay. We, we start now already because not everybody is back, but online. Uh, that's what they do non-stop. Hmm? That's what they do non-stop. So, so we are happy to be back uh, with a, a, a colleague and an old colleague, um, Raymond Slaughter from the Netherlands Space Office. We're super happy to have him as a keynote. Um, and to give a talk uh, about the activities of the Netherlands Space Office, especially about the Copernicus program. So please, Raymond, uh, keep it uh, keep it to, uh, let's say, uh, um, 30 minutes, and then we can have a discussion, please. Yes. Okay. Thank you, Tom. And I'm so happy to see real persons, because this is the first, uh, and also many online persons, because this is really the first uh, presentation I gave in uh, one and a half years. So I'm really happy to talk about uh, the Copernicus program, which we, man which we manage on national level uh, from the Netherlands Space Office. Um, but I would like to start with this image showing the constellation of uh, ESA satellites that have been built the last 20 to 30 years, and most of them the last 10 years. And especially the Copernicus satellites, satellites will be the red line uh, during my talk today. Um, I will give an overview of the, uh, the, the, the operational Copernicus uh, program with the Sentinel satellites. I will uh, talk about the, 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 the next generation Sentinels and high priority candidate missions. I will talk about the Earth explorers, the scientific missions of ESA. And then uh, we'll talk about the ways to access all these data, both the classical way and both the novel way and what's coming. Uh, I'm Raymond Sluiter. Uh, I'm a physical geographer. I did a PhD in land remote sensing and GIS, actually hyperspectral remote sensing. And now I'm uh, advisor data and applications at the Netherlands Space Office, the Netherlands Space Agency. Um, there I'm a delegate for, the, um, for ESA in the Data Operations Scientific Technical Advisory Group where the entire um, Earth Observation Program is reported uh, every, every, uh, every three months. And I'm doing that already for 10 years, so uh, I have quite some uh, historic information in my mind, in my brain. Uh, for moreover, I started to be the coordinator of the Horizon Europe Space uh, Program in the Netherlands, and I'm a an, um, an general Copernicus expert and a data expert, especially on the data infrastructures. Yeah, the Copernicus Program. Um, that's the operational program of satellites uh, from, from Europe. And we started it already, uh, it was first called GMES, Global Monitoring of Environment and Security. And it started in the late 90s, the IDs. And since the, um, 2011, 2012, the first satellites came operational. And now we have many satellites operational. We have um, six Sentinels. Sentinel-1 is radar, uh, is operational, and there's, uh, Sentinel-2 is an optical mission. Three is also optical. Actually, Sentinel-5 and 4 are still being built and will be uh, launched later. And I will uh, discuss them in a little bit more detail in the next slides. And now the A and B units are already launched. Um, but uh, the C and D units for, for every satellite, there will be four, four satellites to, be, to have operational data up to 2030 plus. And that's free and open data, guaranteed. So Sentinel-1 is a SAR mission, an example of uh, flood detection in the, in the Amazon area. Sentinel-2 is a multispectral imager like, like Landsat with 13 bands from visible to, uh, to shortwave infrared, uh, highest resolution 10 meters. With, uh, the, with the two satellites, we now have a revisit time of two to three to five days around the globe, and mainly used for land covering use. And on the right, you see an image of Sentinel 2B in the test uh, facilities in um, in Estec, in uh, in the Netherlands, just before it was launched. Um, yeah, Sentinel 2, I say, said already, it's it's a Landsat-like uh, satellite, and 
we have now, uh, as you can see on this image, uh, we can very good merge the, the both data sets to have uh, very long data data records of um, of land cover. Um, Sentinel three is um, especially for the for the land, the ocean and land color instrument is um, is, is uh, uh, most uh, most used. Uh, it's around 250 meter resolution, but uh, daily um, daily coverage and on, on a large uh, scale, uh, quite uh, for example for entire Europe. Here you see an example of the droughts in in, uh, in 2018. I uh, could show the same in it for 2019, and luckily this year was a little bit uh, wetter. Um, not land related, but Sentinel 5P, Sentinel 5 precursor. Is, um, is an instrument that measures uh, atmospheric gravity, and uh, uh, for example, um, NO2, methane, uh, daily global coverage with a resolution of 3.5 by 7 kilometers. I showed some tulips on it because the instrument is built by the built by the Netherlands, and the, the entire satellite is is built by uh, by ESA, and it's, it's a very successful mission. Um, and here you can see an example of it. Uh, it shows uh, nitrogen dioxide yearly image um, uh, globally, uh, really showing the, um, the, the sources of, um, yeah, of, of air pollution. Uh, you can even see uh, the ship tracks between Asia and, uh, and Europe, and of course, China, Europe, uh, South Africa. Um, we can make these images, uh, we have a daily uh, gl global coverage because it's an optical satellite, so we uh, with a lot of clouds, of course, and we really need uh, day, uh, the global image to see this entire picture, the, the yearly pic uh, image. Uh, there's also a sixth Sentinel, Sentinel-6, uh, Michael Freilich. Uh, actually, that's not a land mission, but um, a mission that uh, with an altimeter that measures the, the sea level and, and sea level change. And um, uh, it was launched uh, last November, and um, it's now in excellent uh, conditions, and the, the operations are started. Um, what I said, yeah, we now have two units of each Sentinel operational now. Um, there will be also Sentinel C and D units to have the continuity up to 2030, because most satellites have a lifetime of around seven years. Um, these units are built now, actually in the, in the pre-phase studies. And the requirements for these units is that they will give the continuity of the measurements of the A and B units. So we will not have big changes uh, for that. But there's also a goal uh, to enhance. Uh, so the goal is enhance continuity. But there's also a goal to have new products and to improve the performance. Um, the Sentinel satellites uh, took 15 years to build them. And you can imagine that uh, yeah, during this um, 15 years, the technology improved. So the technology improvements will be uh, will, will be in the updated uh, satellites, but for example, if you look to Sentinel two, don't expect that it now will have a five meter resolution. We will continue with the ten meter resolution. So now the phase zero studies are ongoing, and the launch uh, will be in the mid to late twenties. Uh, um, but there is more than only the Sentinels because there are more the the, the basic observations and we need more to, to for, we need more observations also with other other techniques and for that the sentinel high priority candidate missions um, apcms are developed and they are now renamed to the sentinels expansion expansion missions so after sentinel 6 there will be sentinel 7 and sentinel 8 9 10 11 and I don't know if they continue the numbering, but what we know is that the first uh, satellite will be the a CO2 mission to measure CO2. And that was uh, decided after, I think, COP20, uh, COP21, before the Trump era, <laughs> the last COP before Trump uh, uh, started. And then uh, there was most uh, high priority that we could uh, measure CO2 uh, in the right way. So this mission uh, is now uh, really being built and we hope we can launch it in uh, 20 to five 
to have a, a good uh, observatory for, for CO2 emissions and uh, CO2 uh, uh, development. And I hope that we can monitor and decrease in, in CO2. But there are not only the CO2 emission, but there will also be emission on uh, polar ice and snow topography, crystal, a passive microwave radiometer uh, simmer. And you can see here on the right the, the three missions uh, for uh, interesting for land, and that's uh, the land surface temperature mission, the CHIME, and hyperspectral uh, imaging mission, and ROSE L, an L band SAR mission, and I will discuss them in the next slides. Yeah, CHIME, we have waited a long time for it, especially myself, because I'm active in hyperspectral land remote sensing already for years. But now uh, Shine will, will, will be, uh, we will have a really a hyperspectral mission from space um, in, the, from the, in the short wave infrared, uh, 400 to 2,500 nanometers, uh, very small bands of 10 nanometer, and expected resolution of um, 20 to 30 meter with a revisit time of uh, 10 to 12.5 days. And um, yeah, uh, the yeah the the there are many applications for hyperspectral or remote sensing like agricultural uh, agriculture, food security, biodiversity. Uh, especially uh, as we have a lot of knowledge and already on, on hyperspectral or remote sensing based on the uh, on some pilot pilot missions and also based on um, on, on missions on uh, on airplanes. Uh, expected launch late to, between 2026 and 2030. Um, there will also be a mission on land surface temperature monitoring. Uh, yeah, we have this capability. We had it, for example, on the ESTER satellite, and we also have it on, on Meteosat, but on a, on a very high, on a very low resolution. But now, and there was on Landsat, on, uh, there's also a tier. And in, uh, in Europe, we didn't have this, these capabilities. So there will now be built um, the LSTM mission, uh, thermal infrared with a spatial resolution of 50 meters. We visit time one to three days because uh, two satellites will be built. It's also important, uh, for example, for the um, uh, correction of, uh, of clouds in, in Sentinel-2 because uh, with thermal infrared, you can do that very well. And there will be the third mission, uh, ROSE L, which is an L band synthetic aperture radar. Um, it's um, then the L band radar. Uh, I'm not a specialist really in, in, in radar, but in Wageningen there are many specialists. But L band radar can penetrate uh, through uh, many materials uh, such as vegetation and, um, and snow and, and ice. So it, uh, it really gives an enhanced information uh, uh, with respect to the to Sentinel-1 uh, C-band. And the expected spatial resolution is uh, five to 10 meters with a swath of uh, 260, uh, 260 kilometers. And it's, for example, it's, it's useful for um, yeah, detection of, of ground motion, but also uh, detection of, of, of biomass and Many many applications uh, for this uh, for this uh, satellite. Um, so the Sentinels are the operational missions, but um, ESA are also working on um, on, on scientific missions, um, and sometimes these scientific missions are upgraded uh, to a Sentinel. But the last uh, ten. To 15 years, um, we have the, the different cent, uh, scientific missions like uh, ADM that measures wind with a, with a, with a laser, Quiosat 2, the radar 2. Uh, I, will, I will show that in the next slide. But ADM measures wind. Earthcare is still to be launched, will we'll, we'll measure clouds. Um, Gautier is uh, now uh, the mission is finished already, but, uh, but measured the gravity uh, field. And SWARM is operational now and measures uh, magnetic, uh, uh, yeah, the magnetic field of the, of the Earth. 
Uh, yeah, I mentioned cryosat. Yeah, it's an um, it's a radar, and it's a really uh, it, it it can very good detect ice. So, for example, if you see the changes of ice in the polar uh, areas, it's um, it's uh, most of the time cryosat that provides this data. Uh, SMOS is the sole moisture and ocean salinity um, um, mission. I show here only the sole moisture um, uh, example. Yeah, it's a passive microwave imager, so it measures the, the, the radar um, uh, signal emitted by the Earth. And actually, that's um, uh, on a, on a, that's on a, on a low resolution, uh, 30 to 50 kilometers. But you can you can have global information on uh, on soil moisture with this uh, with this uh, device. Uh, and more are coming. Uh, we are now building biomass radar mission, really dedicated to to measure biomass. A flex is being built. Uh, it will measure fluorescence, um, uh, vegetation uh, parameters. Uh, they will be launched uh, the next two years. And Forum is a mission uh, dedicated to, to measure uh, the far infrared, and uh, it's really needed to have the, 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 the heat, um, to, uh, yeah, to, to, to measure the heat balance uh, in the atmosphere. And it was decided very, uh, this year that there will also be a Harmony mission uh, measuring um, with a radar um, ocean patterns uh, like circulation. And in Harmony, also the Netherlands, uh, they, they, uh, it is an idea of the Netherlands actually, this mission. Um, if you combine all these missions, you have a lot of information uh, about the climate since, uh, since the 1990s. And to have very long time series. Um, the, the, there is a so-called program that uh, made the essential climate uh, variables, the ECVs. And uh, that's not only Earth observation, but within the, uh, the climate change initiative, um, for many, many parameters, uh, there, are, there are long time series being built. Uh, for example, on, on sea level, sea ice, uh, ocean color, etc. And on the left, you see the, the land-related CCIs, like uh, biomass, uh, high-resolution land cover, land surface temp uh, temperature, soil moisture, and, uh, and land cover. And with this, this brings me, okay, there is a lot of data around and more and more data is coming. And um, yeah, how can you access this data? Now, the classic data access is the, for example, the, the open access data hub. It's, um, it's uh, the classical way to, to download your data. And there is a one open access data hub for, 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 for everybody. And there are other hubs for the Copernicus services. Um, I will uh, tell about it later. Uh, UMETSAT is also um, uh, providing information uh, through UMETCAST and um, through the Copernicus online data access. Uh, UMETSAT is mentioned here because they have activities uh, re related to Sentinel-3. And there are also collaborative data hubs uh, where uh, countries can have a special link to the data uh, for their, for their national, uh, national platforms and data infrastructure. Um, for Copernicus, uh, you can have the, the raw data through the hub, but uh, there are also several services uh, being developed, and um, they are especially used also for, for policy making uh, by, the, by the European government and by the national governments. And there's, uh, for example, the land monitoring service, uh, the marine service, the atmosphere service, emergency monitoring service and the security service and the climate change service. And I think last week, I didn't attend the entire conference, but I think last week the, the climate change service and at least comps have been uh, presented by ECMWF. Um, these services provide um, remote sensing based data, but also data uh, coming from models and data coming from, uh, from, from observations. Um, for ESA, the, these, these are all the, this is all based on, on the Sentinel uh, and the ESA uh, host, uh, operated satellites. 
But a researchers, for the researchers, there is the EarthNet program. Uh, and that's really the backbone. Yeah, it's already for, for 30 years. Um, and there you can, as, as a researcher, you can, uh, you can obtain data uh, from, from, from third parties, like, for example, high resolution data from, from Iconos, um, uh, uh, information from rabbit eye, spot, spot data. And to obtain this data, you have to, to, to write a proposal um, uh, to ESA, and, and uh, then there's a good chance that uh, you are granted access to this. Uh, for me, for more information, you can see the links here. Um, yeah, and access to the data, it's changing because, um, yeah, it's not only data, you also need uh, information. And I think a good example for this is the, um, the, the website of the ESA Climate uh, Office, uh, also related to the, uh, to the CCIs. And here, for example, you, you see the, the links to this uh, climate office, but also to their, uh, to their web viewer. And they have really a very nice web viewer of all these information from the, from, from, from the CCIs. Uh, here I show you the, um, the example of, um, of land cover. You can also download this data, but especially for example, policymakers, this is really data they, they can, uh, yeah, they, uh, they understand or at least I hope they understand. Um, more there for, for uh, because there was a lot of, yeah, the, the, the hubs only provided, uh, provided raw data. So there have also been uh, um, portals being built uh, to access the Sentinel data. And uh, one in, uh, in interesting one is the, the so-called Sentinel hub. It's uh, operated by, uh, by, uh, by Synergize. And, there you can also download data and, and browse all data, but also view the, view the data. Um, yeah, a lot of data, um, and it's, it's, it's really increasing every year. So there is a Sentinel data dashboard where you can see uh, how much data there is, and it's, it's growing every year. Yeah, at this moment for the entire Sentinel missions, we have uh, 380 um, petabytes of data and uh, with uh, more than 40 million uh, different products and uh, half, a million, uh, half a million registered users. And this, this number is increasing every year. And uh, the whole system that hosting this data is now updated also to, uh, to cloud environments. Um, and what you see is that, yeah, during this five, the last five to 10 years, it's not enough anymore that you can, there's so much data, you cannot download everything anymore. And um, you can do it, but you need a lot of space then at your own uh, and, and good, good network connections. But what we see now is uh, we see the development of, of, of big data that you want to combine different data sets, the data science, and um, AI uh, really started to become um, useful the last five years and more than useful because with AI, we can really uh, do the processing more, uh, more efficient. So big data, AI, and data science are really changing the classical ways to access the data. And we are going to, uh, to, to cloud platforms where you can access the data still and download the data, but also can do your, your online uh, analysis. And yeah, Google Earth Engine was, was one of the, the first uh, platforms that, that really uh, provided these, um, these, these possibilities. Uh, I will not click on watch video, but they still have a, a nice video explaining which data sets are there. For example, for the open data hub of the ESA uh, Sentinels, they were the main user because they, 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 they downloaded everything from, from, uh, from ESA3 Open Data Hub. And yeah, they provided this in a, in a, in a nice, very nice platform and an accessible platform, but you cannot do everything in it. It is still limited, but um, I have some, some other colleagues who can tell you more about that, what you can do with, uh, with Google Earth Engine and what not. But you see that this really started uh, an, um, 
yeah, development of also other platforms. And for example, uh, at Amazon, uh, you can uh, they know, uh, they also have uh, the open data available, and uh, there you can also use um, uh, Sentinel data from their uh, own systems. And, and Microsoft uh, also has it in their in their platforms. And there were more things started. And ESA started already five or six years ago with the so-called thematic exploitation platforms where for certain communities there is a cloud pl uh, platform made to, to have uh, information products and analysis facilities. And there are several um, steps uh, being made and now they are all finished and they have to do their, they are not um, hosted anymore by ESA or financed anymore by ESA, but they are now commercial, um, uh, semi-commercial, um, platforms um, and working together with the with the community and there was another initiative um, started by the european commission uh, where they said okay we want to have better platform access to the to the to the copernicus uh, data it's also started i think four years ago or five years ago and then uh, so commercial uh, provided uh, providers um, uh, had startup money to to build up um, their platforms, providing Sentinel data, but also providing uh, processing uh, capabilities uh, in the cloud. And actually, the four started by the EC that are uh, Mundi, so Blue, Creo Dias, and uh, and Onda, and. One of the things we don't know which will will survive <laughs> the, the 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 next five years, but um, but they are still uh, really working on their on their user um, uh, yeah the, the user base. It's not only for uh, scientific users, but it's also for um, uh, for yeah for for commercial users who can make who can do their value adding services within their within their platforms. Um, there was a, is a fifth one, uh, Vikio. And actually, that's uh, semi-commercial because it's um, it's um, co uh, cooperation between uh, ECMWF, UMET, UMETSAT, and uh, Mercator Ocean. Actually, Mercator Ocean is the, opera uh, the operator of the uh, the, the marine uh, services. And what we see is that Wikio is most attracting for the uh, for for researchers, and Wikio is also most active to 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 have the the, the virtual environments and uh, to to include their AI uh, capabilities in the platform. The other ones you can do processing, but not really the the entire AI thing. And it looks like they. Um, they made quite some uh, developments these uh, the last years with that. Uh, because yesterday, I got um, a very interesting announcement of a um, of a MOOC, a massive online open online course on AI for Earth monitoring, and uh, you can see the link here uh, where you can uh, subscribe for this uh, MOOC. It's uh, I think it's six weeks. Uh, it's it's open. Um, yeah, it's. Um, uh, implemented by you, by the, the people who are working with uh, Wikio. So Wikio will be the DIAS there. They will use for their um, for the for the for the for the MOOC. And actually, um, yeah, it's uh, the, the platform is open, uh, accessible uh, on, on a sort of trial basis. Or if you are a low, not not that intense user. And if you want to have more or more pro, uh, processing capabilities, you you you, you need to pay. Um, yeah, there is even more. <laughs> um, yeah, the collaborative ground segments. Uh, the idea with Sentinel was that ESA only uh, should provide the raw data, and that then the the different countries on national level should make their their national customized uh, product, and. Uh, some countries did that. In the Netherlands, we don't have it. <laughs> it didn't happen that we, we had enough mass to, to have this uh, collective ground segment. But uh, you see here the list of all countries that have such a collective ground segment. 
Many of these are just only mirror sites of, of Copernicus data and then mirroring the, the, the data sets for, um, for, the, for the country. But uh, for example, if you are living in the Netherlands, um, Belgium uh, is also mirroring the Dutch uh, uh, territory uh, for, for Sentinel data within their, um, within their uh, Colliptic Ground Segment telescope. And interesting of Terrascope is also that they are on not only a data repository, but they also have a good viewer, but they also have um, um, a virtual machines available to do, uh, to do your uh, processing directly uh, on the data. Same for the um, EODC uh, from Austria. It's, um, yeah, uh, for example, uh, especially they have uh, many data sets also on, on soil moisture and analysis ready data of, of Sentinel-1. Uh, Germany has an initiative, uh, Code DE, also um, uh, yeah, providing quite some, some Sentinel data and also the, the uh, processing capabilities. And they are also uh, organizing workshops on that. And actually they, they also have data outside Germany. And um, yeah, it's really, really interesting. And in the UK, there is CEDA and Jasmine, and um, they also have the, the Sentinel data, and it's really very well linked to high performance uh, computing in the, in the UK. And the, the other countries, uh, I don't have so much details, but I think Sweden, that's really a big data lab uh, approach that, they, uh, that they, they wanted to have. Uh, I'll show you the EODC and uh, the telescope uh, on the right. The data cubes, and then there is another development: data cubes. Um, we have the Euro Data Cube um, that's initiated by by the by the ESA member states. I think it's based on the Open Data Cube, and um, there is a SEALS Open Data Cube and Australian Data Cube. And uh, to have it more. Google Engine-like, there is the, the ESA Open Earth Engine being developed now. And there are also R, and data cubes in R. And there's an uh, interesting data cube, it's called Rastaman. But actually, what's a data cube? <laughs> um, yeah, it's a multi-dimensional um, uh, cube and of, of uh, spatial, spatial data, different data sets. You can query them and analyze them. Um, uh, the different data sets directly, but uh, also in time. So you really have a multi-dimensional uh, analysis engine to do, your, uh, to do your analysis. It's difficult to explain by word, uh, <laughs> but there is a very nice uh, picture on the, uh, there's a very nice movie on the, um, on the ESA website on the Euro Data Cube. Uh, I, yeah, I should say after this meeting uh, started up or look it up and it's really, it's, it's a one minute video, but it's really a good, it gives a good overview of, of what you can do with the data cube because you can really do yeah, multi-temporal analysis, for example, on climate parameters and combine them and see in time where the, where the anomalies uh, are. Um, yeah, there's so much. It's really a forest of trees of, of data platforms uh, available. So uh, ESA started an initiative which called the Network of Resources to have at least a search engine and an overview uh, website of these uh, of the, the the capabilities of all these uh, all these platforms, and the idea is that this is a sort of one one stop shop that you can see which data is available, but also um, uh, services uh, that are available, uh, processing services, um, hosting services, um, and and what it costs. Uh, yeah, the network of um, of, res uh, of uh, resources, it's called. Yeah, um, the way forward. Uh, yeah, we are now at the point that yeah, it's clear that that the analysis in the clouds will be the the the, the way forward, but. We also need good data for that, and the analysis-ready data is, is one of the, yeah, the, the higher level products, not only the raw data, but that you have real good processed higher level products uh, customized for your, uh, for your use. 
Um, yeah, it's an important um, development. And the data federations, so that we don't use one cloud uh, system, but that the different clouds are connected uh, with each other. For example, the um, Wikio is already federated with the EODC and the, and the Terrascope platform, so that you can use resources that are not available in your own platform, you can use it from another platform. And, that's, uh, and for that you need really interoperable systems. Um, uh, OpenEO is a, is a good example of, um, yeah, of, of the um, yeah, uh, an interoperable uh, language or, um, to, to, to connect all these. And you see also that within the European Open Science Cloud, which is far, which is yeah, hallo. remote sending data. Ja, das ist aber auch kompliziert, wenn gleichzeitig Zoom läuft und ich Zoom nicht muten kann. Jetzt habe ich das einfach gelöst, indem ich äh, zwei Kopfhörer dran habe. Auf dem einen läuft jetzt Zoom, auf dem anderen läuft das hier. Uh, what? Okay. Give me a sign. Okay, I can continue now. Yeah, the European Open Science Cloud um, has the same um, goals for uh, the entire Hello? scientific community. And, um, but it's, uh, remote sensing is not, is, is one of the ingredients. An interesting example is the C skill. Is a... Tom, Tom, can I continue or is it, do we have a problem? <laughs> Houston? <laughs> Okay. Um, currently, within Horizon Europe, there is now uh, the C-Skill um, project, and, um, uh, where they they want to to connect the, the the Earth observation data sets to the European Open Science Cloud. And actually, they will have a conference, I think, in in, in October. Look up the Space Office, uh, the Netherlands Space Office website, uh, if you are interested, because we announced it there. And then, yeah. What's really um, happening now is that we go to the, to the, the digital twins. The, um, that we have, what's a digital twin? Okay, you have the, the real space, the real data, that's the physical twin. And the idea is that we mirror this with all the real time information we have, all the, uh, and the, the historic information we, uh, we have and in the virtual space. And that's the so-called digital twin. And for that, you need uh, data fusion. You need to, you need to combine uh, different models. Uh, you have to combine, uh, yeah, high-performance uh, computing. You have to do it in the cloud. Um, you need many data sources. Um, yeah, like for example, uh, the the, obs the normal observations, but also information from uh, Internet of uh, Things sensor sensors and that idea of the digital twin is now really running. It's really, really, uh, yeah, pushed now, both on, on national level in the Netherlands, but also on European level. Uh, yeah, the idea is that with such a platform, you can really reach the, the, the users and um, the, the, the policy makers and that you can do analysis, that you can ask a question, what if I change uh, what if I change this parameter and yeah, what should I do? Really a decision, a decision support system based on, 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 on big data and, and for that you really need, need yeah, heavy high performance uh, computing. Um, EC uh, uh, now starts to build destination Earth and one of the driving things for that is that for the European Green Deal uh, the policymakers need a lot of uh, information to to make their decisions, and the European Green Deal is really the, the driving force of this uh, of this digital twin. Uh, this is more an overview of the infrastructure they they foresee. There will be a big uh, data ware or warehouse of, of data lake, and as, as a sort of core. And on, on top of this, they will make so-called digital twins, and they do that uh, thematic. 
And for the first three to four years, uh, they will uh, start with a digital twin on uh, weather extremes and a digital twin on, uh, on the climate uh, adaptation. And of course, you need on this very technical platform, you need the service, uh, the service layers to provide the information in a useful way for the, um, for the users. And you have to connect the data lake, the, the central data lake, you have to connect that with the, with the other, other available information. Um, actually, now ECMWF and, and UMETSAT and ESA are the, 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 the main builders um, of, this, uh, of this system. So, to, to conclude my talk, uh, I think it's, yeah, it's, it's very good visible that Earth observation is really essential for, for, for land observation and, and climate. Uh, I think many things of climate change, for example, sea level, uh, ice changing, uh, land cover changes. If you have the global images, we, we don't have any global image of all these processes if we didn't, don't have Earth observations. And yeah, what you see is we now really have many operational satellite missions. Uh, more is coming. It's all open. And don't forget, this is only, I'm only talking about European data, but of course, in the NASA is also providing many data sets and yeah, uh, there's this more and more data. And um, yeah, and the data volume is really, really explo exploding. And yeah, many new applications now are driven by artificial intelligence, especially all these digital twin things at Destination Earth. It wouldn't be possible if you don't use uh, artificial intelligence to speed up the processing and uh, yeah, to, to, to smart explore the data. But artificial intelligence is of course not, a, the, yeah, it's not everything. Many people forget that's for good um, AI things. You need training data. It's many forgotten, uh, yeah, everybody forgets it, but we need so much uh, training data and of course the observation data, what's, what's happening in real life to do this. Uh, but I think that uh, has been shown on the, on the conference also this, uh, this week. But we see now really the fast development of the data science and the big data cloud platforms, the analysis in the cloud, and really that it should be federated and then yeah, at the end, the digital twins. And I think many, I don't have many views uh, after that, but I think the digital twin will really be the, the main driving force now for the next years. Thank you. Thank you. This is a fantastic overview. It's a science fiction something. We have time for questions. We're looking at questions online. Uh, you can keep your slides, maybe you will go back to some slides. Mm -hmm. So check in some of the, the chat. And let me kick off with a question. Uh, this digital twin, I mean, it's a, it's a, it's a new term, but um, like, uh, I mean, if you have a time series in the VI or like, like images for the whole world, is that a digital twin? Um, what, is, what does it make it, uh, you know, what's the minimum requirement for something to do? And uh, I think the minimum requirement requirement is that you have these ingredients. Uh, so the of the for example your L I A you mean uh, you 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 mentioned, but uh, that you uh, really uh, I think the important thing is that you combine it with the other data sets, so that not only the remote sensing data sets are available in that system, but also the socioeconomic uh, data sets. Um, yeah, data sets from other uh, sources. That's making a digital twin and um, the, uh, that you reach the end users. So that there is really an interface to the data that the end user can, can get his, the, the information because you can put it all together in one big data lake and do all, data lake and do all your analysis. But if the end users and mostly policy makers don't don't get this information, then uh, then it's then it's useless, and I think that's one of the one of the important things um, uh, now. Also, for the, the you see the developments now with Destination Earth, yeah, it's really it was driven from the uh, from the the Earth Science community, and 
yeah, because uh, technically it's, it's possible now and we see that it's that we have the computing power and we see that it's, uh, that we can do it. But really now the, the, the next step is really important that, that the users uh, uh, are, uh, are engaged. Um, actually, in the Netherlands, uh, there is a professor, Wilco Hazeleger, who was the director of the e-science uh, center uh, two, two years ago. He is now the, um, the, um, the dean of the faculty of geosciences. And he brought actually these ideas of the climate extremes into the into the, the destination Earth because they were really because two years ago they said we are going to make a digital twin of the Earth and then it became silent and then at one time they came with this idea of the of the climate extremes and the, and that appeared to become to, to come from ECMWF and and Wilco Hazeleger uh, was then the, the, the one who brought the message. And actually, the university is also now making a, a, a wiki page, etc., um, uh, for the for the EC to to start this uh, the, the user interaction. Uh, the second question you mentioned there's uh, other space agencies like NASA, and JAXA, and um, I don't know. Um, so uh, there's overlap like NASA and NASA. Or, uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, you know, we scientists, you know, as long as data is open, so you know, we don't need like three data sets. Mm -hmm. I mean, in some cases, mm -hmm. yeah. we need like a one harmonized. Yeah, actually, so the projects that harmonize this. Yeah. Data yeah. data. I showed you the uh, example of the Landsat um, image in the in the Himalaya, with the, um, where the where the Sentinel uh, images were merged with the um, with, with the with the Landsat images. Yeah, there are many uh, initiatives now to to merge these data sets, and that's done on SEALs level. So on um, SEALs is the uh, Committee of Earth Observation. Um, where in, within SEALs, uh, all the international space agencies work together. And, okay. um, you you yeah. haven't added the slides, but so it's SEALs. It yeah, SEALs, yeah. Okay. And Are there any more questions for Raymond? Otherwise, we'll have to go to the next speaker. Uh, uh, Lando, uh, Lando. Uh, thank you for the presentation. And you mentioned about the hyperspectral mission uh, that will be launched. And for me, it's, it's great to uh, think that we'll have a hyperspectral data. Uh, so, because there are so many possibilities to use this data. And for, for you, what will you like? Can, can you explain a bit more what will be the and how many bands, how, what would be the specifications of the mission and what are like the possibilities to use this data uh, yeah. to produce monitoring and different products. Okay, um, this is actually the information I have now. So, <clears throat> um, I don't have the number of bands. But to be in hyper real hyperspectral mission, I, I expect uh, around 200 bands, or within yeah, between 100 and, and 200 bands. Like the uh, there are there are some missions now. Um, yeah, for example, the um, the Prisma mission by Italy that's now operational, but it's, it's really as a narrow swath. But it's actually the only hyperspectral mission usable now. And there is a very small satellite that's called Hyperscout, Hyperscout 1 and Hyperscout 2. And there, that also provides hyperspectral um, data, but that's still not on the scale that the Chime will, will provide. And yeah, this is the information I have now. Uh, I just checked the last uh, uh, quarterly station rep status reports of ESA, and it's now really in the in the definition phase. And yeah, this is what we can ex uh, expect: 20 to 30 meter, and the number of bands will be uh, high because otherwise you cannot do any spectroscopy. Yeah, yeah. Sometimes, sometimes people call uh, um, call, for example. Um, mode is already hyperspectral because that's 30 bands but in my opinion that's not hyperspectral you really need more bands than that and that's also what these have been doing. Thank you, one more time. Um, we have to continue. Yes.
as well. Can also select. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then if you can share your screen. Uh -huh. Test, test, test. Can you hear us? Yes. Okay. We're good to go. Uh, next presenter uh, is Patrick Schratz. Um, he's a uh, uh, he actually works for a, a, a private company in a, a consultancy in uh, Zurich, in Switzerland. And uh, and but he contributes to the open source and and uh, especially to our community. He's uh, he developed quite some functionality already, and we're super happy to have Patrick here with us. Uh, to talk about the MLR tree, which is the upgraded, uh, uh, heavily redesigned uh, machine learning framework in R, and uh, which already won some awards. MLR tree won quite some awards, and it's a it's a group of I think a core group of about ten people developing. Um, so we are very happy to have Patrick with us uh, to show us the uh, the most recent and most hottest uh, functionality of MLR tree. With this, I pass it on to you, Patrick. Yeah, thanks, Tom. Thanks for inviting me and um, giving me the opportunity to talk about MLR3 and what we have to offer for spatial temporal data. Um, yeah, on behalf of, of the team, um, I'll want to say hello to the people in the room and to the people following remotely. And yeah, short information about me, even though Tom did already introduce a lot. So uh, previously I was a researcher at the uh, University of Jena and LMU Munich. Now I'm working in Switzerland uh, in an R consulting company um, called Syncra. And I'm still also doing a PhD in environmental modeling. And um, this PhD also uh, was the starting point for me to getting started with MLR because I had to do a lot of modeling and I was in the spatial domain. Um, so um, there was the initial connection. And besides, I'm doing a lot um, of other contribution to open source, uh, like uh, Gitty, for example, but also way, way more um, projects. And yeah, as Tom mentioned, we have um, the, the old MLR here and we have now the new MLR3, which was released in uh, 2019 at USR in Toulouse. Um, so we're almost two years old again uh, already. And um, yeah, uh, but more to that later. So for, for Syncra in Switzerland, uh, we are about uh, five to 10 people. Um, we have a strong focus on open source and that's why I'm also able to be here today because we try to support open source in, in our daily work. And also we have a lot of our package there from, from different people. We are in our studio certified partner and try to help with everything related to R, setting up the infrastructure, but also getting the code more efficient. Um, yeah, so let's talk about MLR3. So I'll first give you um, kind of a general introduction to MLR3 before we dive into the spatial temporal part. So you know what, what MLR3 is about, um, how, how we designed it and, and so forth. So why do we want to use MLR3 and what are the key principles will be the content of the following slides. And um, if you want to see all the code that's spread um, among the slides, um, there is a gist on GitHub, which you can access here. And you can also um, see the slides online um, um, using this URL at the bottom. So usually when we want to do machine learning or modeling in general, right? We want to do training, we want to predict, we want to benchmark different methods. Usually we use multiple data sets. Sometimes we want to evaluate different tuning methods. Um, eventually even also use feature selection. And um, the best outcome would be if we could all do, um, do this using the same syntax, right? We want to um, not have to rewrite code for every specific algorithm that we want to use, but would be so great to, to have all in a, in a common um, way of writing the code. And these were really the design principles of, of the old MRR, but also of the new MNR3, and we try to make it even better um, in the new version. So here are kind of, that's an overview of the, of the machine learning building blocks. So you, you can say, so on the left, you see, um, we have all the learners, so the algorithms that we want to use. Um, we can then, uh, we can apply these algorithms to certain tasks, we call them, right? Tasks or classification, uh, regression, there, and there are more specialized tasks like cluster tasks, survival tasks. So task is a wrapper word um, that we use for um, the data set, including metadata of what we want to do with the data set. 
So what is the type of the response variable? Do we have some groupings that we want to account for and so forth? So um, in, the, in the really inside, you have the data set, which is in MLR3 a data backend, and it's wrapped into a task. And the task is really the central piece um, of, of your data set information that you can pass to any um, operation in MLR3. Then on the right, we have um, the, the big block of optimization. So usually you want to tune the hyperparameters of your model. Um, you also want to do feature selection um, eventually. So this is all kind of optional, but usually it's, it, you always do it, right? You want to do it and you want to do it in an easy way and you want to explore multiple methods. And the, the two blocks at the bottom, um, the pre-processing and resampling, they're kind of um, standalone as well. So pre-processing is, is often um, maybe even the biggest part of everything, depends how, how uh, your data set is composed, yeah, if you have a lot of missing values, if you want to do other pre-processing operations before you actually do the training and prediction. Um, and for all of the pre-processing, so we use the MLR3 pipelines package, uh, which I will introduce later with more detail. And then there's the resampling. So the resampling is, is uh, usually used for uh, evaluating, evaluating the performance of your model. So at some point, it's, it's, uh, you need to score and to kind of um, give an uh, estimate how good your model is yeah, using uh, different measures. And you usually try to uh, want to do this in an, in an unbiased way. So you want to do this quite often in a repeated way with different kinds of data sets um, to really have an, an accurate estimate of, of what your model can do if you then do a, a prediction on unknown data, possibly for the full complete world, right? And this is where the resampling comes into place. So usually it's used in, within a cross-validation um, where you subdivide your data set in training and test. And there are multiple ways how you can do the resampling. And this is um, a big block as well. So yeah, and um, in MLR3, we actually want to unify all of these blocks, right? So we want to have unified interfaces to train and predict methods, um, to hyperparameter optimization, to the, do the pre-processing independently from the data at, before you put them in, in, into the training and predictions. And uh, we also want to give an easy access to parallelize all of this. And um, the same goes for the error handling. At the end, so this was really our motivation to make things easier, especially with all the available algorithms that are available in R. So um, then, the, another question that comes up quite often: Well, is it is it worth to to learn this this framework, right? So um, you can either go with the guys on the right and say, "No, oh, well, we're too busy." Um, whatever that means, like and we are all busy, right? Uh, but usually our experience is that um, learning, le learning a framework once means you profit from it in the long run. And I've never seen um, a person only fitting one model in their life. So usually whenever it comes to scaling up um, to trying different algorithms, different methods, you would need to dive into all the single implementations in R that, that are out there. And every package does it a bit differently. And with MLR3, you can really have a unified um, take on this and uh, rely also on the tested functionality. So for a lot of implementations and packages we support, we kind of have extra tests running in our, um, in our uh, MLR3 ecosystem that uh, ensure that these things are really working down to the detail. So um, we have um, predefined performance measures also, uh, which uh, we have listed in a, in a large collection in our MLR3 book, which is the main documentation that you could um, go to and, and see how everything um, can be done. But you can also, uh, again, make use of the just simplified integrated parallelization using the future framework, uh, which is just making parallelization so easy by just applying one line and saying, well, I want to go parallel. How many workers do I want to have? And then you just go. So all of this in the end is, is wrapped here in the so-called MLR3 verse. That sounds similar to the tidyverse, right? And it kind of is because this kind of package is just a wrapper package that loads, that loads all of the different MLR3 packages 
um, that are out there. And if you're wondering why we have so many packages, well, it just simplifies everything on the development side. It's like the old MNR, everything was in one package. It was un almost unmaintainable at the end. And um, now we split it up. We can really um, delegate resources way better. And we know that it might be a bit of more of a hassle for people to load so much packages, but you can use MLR three words, which just does this job for you. All right, so let's have a look at some code. So um, this is really a, a really um, simple and short um, broken down example of um, how you can use MLR3 from starting with an example task that is built in into the uh, package here and ending up with um, an, a plot of uh, a benchmark comparison. So these are not, not even 20 lines, I'd say. I don't know how much in detail. But um, let's go through a bit to, to showcase what's happening here. So first we load the MLR three verse package. Then we set a seed for reproducibility here. And here um, with, in this line, we, um, we load two example tasks. So these are two data sets um, that are already um, enclosed in a in task in, in MLR. Um, and then they are just available to you to, for such easy examples. You, you probably know the Iris data set and the German credit data set is also quite, quite well known. And this is here is the syntax then to, to just uh, yeah, load uh, some learners. Right here we, for example, load an R part learner and the Ranger, which is the uh, fastest package for doing random forests in R. And you see we always prefix either with, with um, classification or regression um, learner, depending on, on what kind of task we want to apply the learner on. And this is always the same syntax. And uh, we have here these shortcut functions like uh, LRNNS, and here like TSKS, which stands for task, and here this means learners. And then you just have a list of, of these learners. And then you would just go ahead and say, well, I want to do a benchmark grid. Well, I want to benchmark all these learners um, um, across these tasks, and I want to do a cross validation. So, and then you have your benchmark grid, and then you call the benchmark function to have your benchmark result object. And uh, we have integrated also a lot of autoplot methods, so ggplot autoplot methods, which is the same as the generic plot methods in, in base R, which you can then just apply on the, um, let's get this out of the way here a bit, which you can just apply to uh, the benchmark result object and say, well, please compare them on this measure, and then you get this plot on the side here. So this is really MLR3 in a nutshell. Usually your code might be a bit longer because you want to do more, more tuning, like we don't do a tuning here, right? We just benchmark the, the raw learners with their default hyperparameters, um, and you want to do feature selection, but that's a good way to start here. So in general, in MLR3, we, want to, um, we were using the R6 um, object-oriented framework, which, is, um, which overcomes a few limitations of the S3 that we are using before. Um, we can use, uh, really nicely make use of, of class inheritance, like you see on the right. So we have a, a, a main learner class, and then we have kind of subclasses for the regression and classification learners. And then we have the in individual learners, like you, for example, the R part. And whatever is defined in the top class gets inherited down to the child classes. So um, this is really nicely possible. And uh, by, by using a um, data table, we are quite fast on the backend side. Uh, because data tables is, is just uh, a really nice way of handling data frames in a, in, a, in a fast way, in an efficient way. And combined with the future framework of parallelization and the logger framework um, for log outputs and for error handling, we really uh, have, uh, in our view, a good selection of um, very good implementations in R that uh, play very nicely with, with the machine learning concept that we want to provide to users. So here's a, a visual overview of how many packages are currently available in the MLR3 verse. So um, some of them are colored um, in green, which means they're on, on CRAN and they are stable and we, we are quite happy with them. Some of them are in, in orange, which means yeah, they exist and they might even exist on GitHub and you can download them, but there's no real guarantee that everything will work in these packages and or they are quite new. But the, the difference between uh, these packages in the, in the orange state can be, can be quite large. And currently there's no package in red, which means we have some plans to do that, but there, it doesn't exist at all yet. Um, 
yeah, so that's just as a, as a quick overview. You can see that uh, we have here in, in the learner side all the packages related to this category. We have some um, packages specifically for, for data handling to get the data in, uh, also DB connectors, so for, for common databases. We have a lot of packages for different tuning methods um, and for hyperparameter handling. And you can see that there are also quite fancy things among them like flexible midged integer evolutionary strategies. So um, yeah, given that the MLR team is composed out of statisticians from University of Munich in Dortmund mainly, um, we, we really have a strong focus also on, on this tuning uh, side. And then here down, uh, bottom right, you see um, it's, it's labeled as tasks. So it means um, packages for different specific, for, for specialized fields. And I would count like the spatiotemporal area as kind of a sub field, specialized field in that. So what do we have in the back here? We have this MRL3 spatial temp series, which is for spatial, spatial temporal resampling methods. And we have the MLR3, MLR3 spatial um, down here, uh, which is quite new and uh, was just finished before, before the workshop here. So um, um, which I'm very happy to present uh, what, it, what it can do and hopefully make, make spatial data handling a bit easier. All right, so let's dive in um, to spatial temporal data. Um, what's in the back? What do I need to be aware of? What is actually still missing? What um, is still up for development? And well, can you actually contribute? Of course you can, but like how? Um, so MLR3 spatial temp survey is for the resampling methods that you would use in cross-validation, for example. And with MLR3 spatial, um, we have support for spatial data backends and in, um, integrated parallelized prediction support for any kind of raster image that you can imagine. So sh let's showcase MLR3 spatial. So the common um, spatial classes and packages in R are Terra, Raster, and Stars for, for the raster on the raster side and SF on the vector side. So we have uh, dedicated data backends now for all of these classes, so you can just um, use these objects as you have them in, in your session, put them into a data backend in a task and just label them in the MLR3 framework. Uh, we have parallelized future-based predictions, which means um, if you do a prediction on a large raster, you can parallelize this prediction because usually it takes quite long to, to do some large predictions on large raster objects if, if you have a high resolution and many values or you want to go uh, for a worldwide prediction. And the last point that's actually quite unique is that we have memory aware predictions, which means you can do these predictions in chunks because at some point you need to load the raster data into your memory, even if you just do it on a subset and this takes um, a lot of memory and sometimes it exceeds your memory. Not everybody has a, a huge server there. Uh, and we have the option built in now that you can select kind of a chunked way of doing this prediction. It takes a bit longer, of course, than doing everything at once, but at least it offers the possibility um, to, to uh, conduct these large predictions at all. And uh, this is not available in any of the native packages uh, directly. So let's, let's show an example what, um, how ML3 spatial can be um, applied. So here we load some packages, then we load um, an example Landsat 7 data set from the stars package. Um, we just read that in, and then we have a stars object, and then we just call as data backend on, on this object to um, transform it into an ML3 uh, data backend here. And now that we have um, this uh, data backend, so maybe to explain a bit more about this data set, it's just a standard Landsat 7 um, ETM scene with uh, six layers. And um, yeah, we can later see also what, what, what's inside, but that's not really the, the most um, important point here right now, um, because I really want to showcase you how you can do it with, on the code side and, and how the, the syntax is going. So um, we define a, a regression learner here and say, okay, we want to um, um, create a regression task with this backend that we just created and our response variables should be uh, the first layer. 
Then we, um, just for the sake of the example, subdivide here the, the data that we've just read in, in training prediction set, usually you would have a, a dedicated prediction object that you would want to predict on, but this is just for, for showcasing reasons now. So we subdivide in, in training prediction set and say, okay, let's now um, take the learner and train it on that task with the subset of, of the training um, rows here. Yeah, well, then we have trained the learner and then we can call the predict spatial on it, um, on the task. And we, so what we do here is that we, we train, uh, we predict, we use the trained model to predict it on the full task that we've just seen. And we can also specify um, the output format here. So you can select between stars, Terra, raster, and you get out uh, the predicted um, object as a stars object here. And here's uh, in the layer one, of the, of, the, of the prediction object, you just see what you have just right now predicted. Um, if we plot this using the integrated plot method of the stars um, package, because we have the stars object now, you can see what, what we got out. So this is the, actually the cadmium concentration here. And um, by coloring it, you can see that in the bottom right, we have, we have higher values. And in the, in the top left, uh, we have lower values. Um, so this is what the prediction in the end um, showed us and um, we could just quickly apply all these all these nice functions from the package directly because we have them in generative format. Um, that's really MLR3 spatial from getting your data in, training a learner, predicting to um, a spatial object in a, in a nutshell. And usually these objects that we predict on are quite big, right? So they it can have millions of values and um, it takes some time to run even if you're on a, on a large machine. So what is usually required here is that you go parallel. I mean, we have seen a lot of parallel applications also in the first days of our training sessions here and um, many more people um, like to use all of the resources on their computers, especially given that in the last 10 years, um, the machines became quite good and have a lot of cores, also the local machines. So, well, let's use it. And we can uh, easily do this um, because we make use of the internal MNR3 predict function, which just um, is able to, to paralyze everything it gets and uh, using the future framework. So I um, can show you a benchmark here, how we compare, how this compares on a file that is 500 megabyte on disk, which actually is not that big, right? But uh, we, we created one that has around, it has around 25 million values. Um, this is the, the um, uh, function you can use in the MLF3 special package to recreate this. And here on the right, you see a benchmark. It might be a bit small, so I'll explain what, what you can see here. So um, we have benchmarked MLR3, um, a Terra 4 cores. Um, so meaning we have uh, used the Terra object to, to load it into a data backend and then used MLR3 with MLR3 spatial to, to make a parallelized prediction. Um, here on the, the second um, line from the bottom, we have used the Terra package just natively without MLR3. Um, something is going on with the, with the parallel predictions of, of Terra. Um, it starts, but it takes very long to initialize and to, to gather things. So. It might be that I've, we've done something wrong here, but um, uh, it currently it just looks like this. So, but it could be it could be wrong. So, it's just to say because I'm quite suspicious that it's quite so slow. So, and here on the top, um, we've done the same things uh, for for the raster package. So, we we loaded the uh, the, the, the spatial file object as in uh, with the raster package into an MLR3 data backend, and then we parallelized it. And here we did a native way. And you see that if we use um, the, the way with MLR3, combining it with Terra, we are quite, quite faster than all the other methods here. So um, you see here, we are about like 20 seconds. Um, depends, we have three runs here and the others are um, around 30 seconds or 29 seconds and um, doing it uh, with the Terra four cores, it's quite slow, but I, I'd maybe even exclude that. I'm not sure if that's uh, if there's an issue right now. So, but you can see we can scale up here a bit and quite easily, and it'd be even faster than the the native predictions. 
And um, that's all what, what ML3 can offer. So direct data back handling um, for all the raster packages and, and also for the vector classes, which I didn't show here, parallelized predictions. And also I did not show how to do the trunk predictions, um, but you can also check that out in the, in the documentation and in the um, ML3 book. So next topic, let's go to ML3 spatial temps to be for the resampling. So ML3 spatial temp CV is, uh, contains a lot of spatial temporal resampling methods. Uh, I think there are almost 10 in total now supported. I would have to look the exact number up in detail. Um, it, besides only providing these resampling methods in, a, in, a, in the same easy syntax that you can use any other resampling method in ML3, it also comes with the autoplot methods for, for visualizing all your spatial resamplings that were actually done on the data set. So you can actually see how things were dis are distributed. Um, we have an upcoming paper um, that we are going to submit to JSS soon. And we are currently wrapping, um, ah, well, I have it on a slide, so no need to guess, eight resampling methods from, from four different packages in R. And uh, potentially there will be even more packages because people have apparently like to publish their uh, resampling methods in, in a standalone package rather than directly contributing it maybe to, to a framework. So we keep on wrapping um, single island solutions uh, from R so that you as a user have um, a simple way of, of addressing them. So what is the problem actually when doing um, cross-validation and um, resampling in R with spatial temporal data? So usually if you do a non-spatial resampling, and you don't account for, for your spatial data, you um, get into trouble because you, you will have an overestimate in your performance, mainly due to the spatial or spatial temporal autocorrelation. So they, they exist in both ways, meaning that your training and test set are quite similar, but just because for the sake of being close together. Uh, and usually you want to have independence of your data, which is not um, guaranteed if you don't account for spatial autocorrelation. Um, so there is no single best method that I, I could say, well, use this method or that method. I always get this question because it really comes down to the data characteristics of your data set and what you want to predict on. So there's a term of um, the target oriented prediction idea. So what, I, what do I want to predict actually with the model do, that I want to fit? And in the same way that I, you answer this question, you have to um, set up your resampling because your resampling should quite closely reflect what you want to actually do with the model in the end. So then it's, it's a fair estimation of, of what you want to do. So there is no single best method. Every method has its advantages and disadvantages, and it really depends on your data set. And currently there's also quite recently, there was a debate coming whether all of the spatial temporal resampling methods, if you apply them, um, might, be, might lead to a too pessimistic um, uh, outcome of your performance. Well, there's ongoing research about this and there will always be a debate probably. And in my opinion, the, the truth is lying somewhere in between. So clearly non-spatial resampling is too over-optimistic. It might be that certain spatial resamplings lead to a maybe too pessimistic one, but it's really hard to, to really say, well, that's, there's the truth, right? The truth is somewhere in between, in my opinion. And uh, we should do um, science to evaluate this even more and see what, what we can find out and what is the, the best middle way. So let's, let's look at some examples for the spatial resampling methods. Um, let's do some cross-validation using random forest again for um, predicting landslide events, either they occurred or not, didn't occur in, in Ecuador. So we have a built-in data set in ML3 spatial temp CV. Um, but I'd also show you how to recreate that again from scratch here. So we use the built-in data set Ecuador. We are setting the coordinates and creating an SF object. And if you look where we are here, using the map view package, you can see here, oh yeah, right. We are even, we are in fact in Ecuador, Southern Ecuador. So that's the data we are currently using here. Um, then we wrap it into a spatial temporal classification task. Um, using that the backend, setting, setting our response variable to slides and say, well, the positive class is true here, actually. So that's what we then get. That's how the, the, the printout of a task looks like. So we have all the metadata information here. We have information about what are the features and what are our coordinates. 
then we define again um, our our learner here and here is the actual important part so we define the spatial resampling method so here we say okay we want to do a repeated spatial cross-validation and here chords is the method which refers to um, a k-means based uh, clustering method after branding and we want to uh, use four folds and we want to repeat it two times so in reality you would use more repeats here usually to get an accurate estimate and reduce the variance overall then we just use the resampling method, put in the task, the learner, and our created resampling object, and then we aggregate all of the results um, using the built-in aggregate method score and using the classification error here, CE, as the score. So that's, again, a really broken down um, nutshell um, example of how this is going to be uh, executed in the end and can be done. Um, but I think it, it nicely illustrates um, firstly, the syntax, and also here, the only thing you need to change to go spatial is instead of writing CV, repeated spatial CV chords. Then I want to showcase you the auto plot output. So here at the top, we put in the, the spatial um, resampling object that we've just created from the task. And uh, we can say then, hey, yeah, please uh, visualize us this on the task that we just created. I want to see the first two folds. And here you see how the clustering happened. So the k-means clustering, um, you see that uh, it groups um, the observations in training tests in a, in a, in a k-means way. So you have, uh, while well, they cluster around it themselves and it tries to break it down to what we've uh, instructed it to do to four folds. And in the first fold here, the upper right part would be the test set. And here, the test set would be somewhere in the middle. So this is really a nice illustration to also demonstrate what you're actually like running, training and predicting on. Um, and this works for all resampling methods that we have supported. So more resources, um, you can check the spatial temporal analysis chapter in ML3 book, which should be the first go-to place um, if you want to seek help. You can check the function references of the packages, for example, ML3 spatial temp CV. And when it comes to spatial um, partitioning, hyperparameter tuning, I recommend these two, two papers here. One of them is also from, uh, from myself, which deals with nested cross-validation for spatial hyperparameter tuning. So what about spatial temporal methods? Um, well, we have two spatial temporal capable methods in the, in the package. Um, the one is uh, CSTF, which is the one from Hannah Meyer. Um, and the other one is a, a spatial temporal uh, clustering method from, from a, unfortunately um, non-open source um, algorithm named Pluto. They support clustering both in space and time. In general, spatial temporal it's not an easy thing, right? Spatial is, let's say, quite easy because you're only dealing with one dimension. But when it comes to two dimension, it's quite challenging and there are not so many things that we can also just use and, and uh, build into the package. Um, we have the spatial, uh, the ML3 temporal package also, which we want to um, use for, for temporal um, applications, but um, I'm more into spatial also, and we really would love to see help and contributions from the community here. We, uh, also manpower, you know, or women power, let's say like this. Um, uh, just engage with us if you want to participate here, if you like the concept. Um, I'll do this mainly on the side as I've introduced. I'm also working uh, in, in, a, in a company usually. Um, I've limited time. I try to do my best. We all try to do our best. Um, talk to us if you, if you like this, engage with us and um, yeah, then make things better, hopefully. So thanks to, to Mark Becker, especially also, he's one of the main contributors on the spatial side uh, that helps me here um, with his knowledge and his, his coding. Um, thanks also to the sponsors of, of MLR, especially OpenTU Hub, which kindly helps us to, to host some workshops also and donates to um, the whole um, project per se. And thanks to you for being interested in, in MLR and hopefully um, maybe even interested more now in getting started uh, to simplify your, your modeling. And um, if you try this and save some time, um, even if it's uh, just for parallelization or whatever else, um, then we did our job and we're happy that, that our efforts work out. 
So thanks a lot for listening. And yeah, I'm open for questions now. No? No? Okay. I don't see any questions okay. here. Uh, here are questions? Yes, then. Uh, the question would be whether well, there are kind of special spatial learners, or do you use kind of standard learners? Yeah, good question. Um, there are special learners. They would be supported in the ML3 extra learners package then. Um, we, or maybe in the spatial package that is not yet clear. So there's also yet a note on, on the package. Um, I'm not on top of my head know what kind of spatial learners we currently support. Um, I would have to look that up in the list, but so there are definitely spatial learners in R in general, and these could be then used in the same way if you wrap them. But for in ML3, we first have to kind of support them in the first place. So we have to wrap them um, in our package. So this is the work we have to do. So, but in general, yes. Have you done some benchmarking, same data, same algorithm, but size is learned? <laughs> um, no, unfortunately not. That would be an interesting thing. Um, we, well, yeah, tried to, we talked also with the Scikit Learn guys at some point to see also what they are doing and to, um, yeah, get ideas, exchange ideas, but we didn't do yet, I think, a one to one benchmark. That's an interesting idea. So, please come to stay one week with us and learn with Python. Yeah. Let's see that. Let's Yeah. Okay. Uh, more questions? Basically, you know, the, I, I like the post ML3. Uh, it's, uh, it makes, uh, so it's more efficient. It makes machine learning really accessible. Uh, but machine learning is also, it's kind of like uh, many people use it a bit blindly. And what I say, uh, um, they shoot themselves in the foot, right? Um, so one of the examples is the overfitting, overfitting extrapolation of uh, is there any, uh, did you build in any interpretable machine learning diagnostics in the end of tree? Can you, can you do like see that like one point, let's say it's a time point and it sticks out? Um, yeah, that's a good point. You mentioned with uh, um, knowing what, you, what you're doing and then overfitting potentially, because the problem is of course, you always get a value back and it's a number and you have to put meaning to it, right? So otherwise it stays a number and yeah, we, have, we don't have any kind of like easy uh, um, things built in that would prevent you from, from doing bad things. I mean, in the end, you're at some point on your own, but when it comes to model interpretation and other things, we have connectors to the IML and Dalex package for model interpretation and further diagnostics that you can do there, um, especially for, for variable importance uh, things and others. But when it really comes down to the, to the, to the core implementation of what your code does, um, you need to dive in, yeah? And this is always, uh, and, and, and understand what you do. So this is always a problem. The more simple you do, uh, you make complicated stuff, the more easier it becomes to make mistakes. And I think at some, we have to find a middle way there. And maybe the best solution to this in the end is also to have well um, educated supervisors or you educate yourself in, in a good way. Um, because machine learning is not a thing you do on one day and then you have the model and then you go to your boss and say it's done. You really need to understand the details, what it's doing. And um, I, I would yeah, highly recommend this to everybody to, um, after you've done your model, you've done everything, you've done the cross validation, you've done the prediction, go through it again, rethink every step, what it's really doing. And if it's doing that, what you would expect it. So, yeah. Okay, thank you. So, uh, can we make a little break just to move to the next stage? We have a discussion on the thing, but it is the same.
Yes. Uh, let me just. Oh, just. Okay, so we're good to go. Okay. Um, it's audible. Can you say something? Test. Closer. Okay. Oh, like this? I don't hear it. Let me just change my mouse, I think. Sorry. Yes. Yeah, what do you want to do? I will add all the options. Yeah, yes, this one. Thank you. Can you try now? Test. Better? Okay. No, no, it's fine. <laughs> okay. Okay, perfect. <laughs> um, so, hello again from my side. Uh, we've met before in the first day uh, when we talked about open source, and now we are um, organizing within the frame of our project GeoHarmonizer uh, panel discussion that we uh, a discussion of related to the open data entire idea. So it is the almost the end of our event, the end of our conferences, and you have heard a lot of wonderful uh, projects, a lot of wonderful solutions, and I can hear myself. YouTube, you have to browser. Okay. okay. <laughs> Apologize. <laughs> uh, so, as I was mentioning, you have heard about a lot of wonderful projects, initiatives, solutions, uh, packages, and so on and so forth. And you have also heard a lot of uh, the open data paradigm. So, a lot of this, um, a lot of a lot of times, this concept um, popped up. And um, although it might seem um, like the normal way of doing things uh, at this at this point, it still isn't. And I am just going to start with about a few slides, um, a short uh, introduction into the wider concept of, uh, of open data and especially geospatial data, the one that we work with, even if we are, I don't know, hardcore developers, we still cannot take our solutions away from the from the data. So. It, um, it has an influence on everyone. So I will start with about a few slides, 10, 15 minutes of presentation into the, uh, into the topic, um, raise some questions that I hope I will, you know, will spark some, some discussions. And I would also like to invite you to join this Slido. You can just enter from your phone from whatever device and introduce that code. 
Uh, there we will post a few questions related to, uh, to our discussion. Also, there is a possibility for you to ask a question, but um, we will all monitor all channels through which you can, uh, you can contribute to the discussion. Okay. Okay. So we start. As I was mentioning at the invitation on the first day, this is a discussion that is taking place within the context of a European project that we are developing. You've heard a lot about it during these during these days. It is the Geo Harmonizer project that is based on uh, free and um, open source solutions for geospatial and open data. It is based on open data. It produces open data, and on the on the um, on the Lower, uh, lower side, you can see that, of course, there are some financial, uh, some financial information related to, related to the project. So the consortium happily won the project and we started doing the job. We started working, we started um, building an app, a uh, data portal, um, adding various functionalities. We started computing and uh, developing and producing new, uh, new data sets, new added value data sets based on, um, on existing um, um, data sets. And you've heard more about these projects within this uh, line of financing from the European Commission on the first, uh, on the first day. So, the idea is that everything is fine within the, within the framework of the project, but what happens afterwards? What happens after the, finan the financing is, is over? As I was mentioning on, uh, on the first day, in this particular case, the OpenGeo Hub took the, uh, took the um, responsibility of supporting the, uh, the portal as well as the uh, development of the data product because it is a time series time passes so you have to you have to enhance your uh, your data set they took the responsibility of keeping up this um, uh, the initiative for five more years so um, that is a wonderful uh, that's a wonderful initiative but is this the sustainable way and there is no um, um, no clear indication that this is something that will be, uh, you know, repeated by other consortium, other companies in other projects, so on and so forth. And I am sure that everyone in this room had an issue at least once trying to identify data sets from other projects, European or not, and have not succeeded um, and got mostly a 404 error. So. As um, as you've already uh, you know, as you already know, you probably know, this this section of data is just one part of a larger context, and the open data is a part of a larger context related to the uh, to the open paradigm. And uh, what is much more uh, um, popular, let's say, among the, among our community is the open source. Right, but open data is also an important an important resource. But it's just one of the resources there, and it's just one small part that we will that we will focus in this uh, in this uh, in this discussion. So what we decided when we started to when we wanted to start, uh, you know, brainstorming some ideas on how we can make an open data project sustainable on the long term. Um, was to see in the geospatial world related to geospatial data that is of importance, but not only for the scientific community or not for just for a niche. And the first thing that came to our mind was data sets that are related to uh, location, right? We all have to get from point A to point B, right? No matter if you're a scientist, a software developer or whatever else. So um, we looked at, globally speaking, who were the main providers of 
right, of geospatial data allowing you to, to navigate. So at the beginning, we had, of course, Tele Atlas and Navtech Maps, right? And then uh, Tele Atlas was uh, bought by Tom Tom, Navtech by uh, Nokia Maps, and then here. And you can also notice the OSME, like small at the beginning um, initiative. But what happened in, for example, in 2008? In 2008, Google Maps announced that, um, and all these uh, data sets, global data sets, were of course proprietary. Um, in 2008, with the development and the extreme progress, let's say, of the shiny smartphones, uh, in September, Google announced this turn-by-turn -turn navigation but, um, accessible through these new smartphones, right? So um, that announcement in 2008 made um, made some effects in the in the uh, in the market related to global proprietary data sets for navigation. So you can see this is just uh, um, a screen from a screen capture from the way that the stock prices for TomTom Tom, right um, made a made a bid fall at that point in September 2008, and then Garmin, and if you have any curiosity in this direction, you can see how that, that announcement, together with what it meant, makes, uh, had consequences within the, the owners and the sellers of the data sets, of course, together with the, uh, with the navigation tools. So uh, going going further in time, you know, coming closer to our to our days at this point, um, most of us know about the OpenStreetMap initiative. Right? OpenStreetMap initiative also offers a global data set, a global map, but it has a completely different. Um, model of sustainability. It is a volunteer project. It was initiated in 2004 and it built upon the success of Wikipedia at that point at the development of um, GPS technology and not only development but lowering prices. It was not, it was no longer just the, uh, you know, the um, the, let's say the right of the possibility for cadastro companies to buy GPS receptors, but it, it became more and more uh, pervasive. So uh, in 2004, the initiative was started, but it, as I mentioned, it is fully uh, based on volunteer, uh, on volunteer contribution. The entire infrastructure is being supported by uh, the academia. Uh, the academia environment, so um, that is their that is their model, and of course on the other on the other side of the um, uh, of of our slide, we we have the other uh, let's say orientation um, data set, uh, which is which has the proprietary model. And even if uh, OpenStreetMap had a different uh, had a different model, it was sustainable. It was sustainable, and maybe one of the best examples and one of the best proofs in that direction is that it is it sustains important companies and um, important and powerful companies, and this ecosystem is is growing. So probably most of you have heard about Mapbox, Mapillary, uh, probably some of you have played Pokemon Go, which started with having as its map Google Maps, but then it changed to OpenStreetMap. Um, the humanitarian OpenStreetMap team, which is also for a project from Austin May, Foursquare, uh, ways which you know uh, changed from OpenStreetMap to, to Google Maps, uh, Facebook which uh, based its geographical information on awesome data, and so on and so forth. So that is one example related to how a data set which is of interest for most, um, um, for, uh, for the, the bigger, the wider community involved in, in time. So another, another very close to home, at least in our, in our case, is related to satellite data, right? satellite imagery. We had a very good presentation, a very informative presentation earlier, uh, and um, the open data uh, notion appeared a lot of times, but things weren't always this way. 
So, um, you know that the Landsat mission is the longest uh, man, um, human um, program for observing the, observing the Earth, but it wasn't always open and the information was, uh, the data sets were, uh, the data wasn't, um, wasn't freely available. That changed in 2008. The idea is that in the, uh, in the uh, figure on the right side, you can see uh, who was responsible within the, uh, uh, within the United States, let's say. Um, um, who was responsible for collecting the data, for storing it, and so on. And at the beginning, USGS was just one of the receivers of that, uh, uh, of the imagery. Other receivers were, for, were uh, calculated, if I can say so, in an um, international, um, um, I'm missing the point, ICs, international uh, um, Anyway, it was, uh, there were um, private companies that would pay a fee to USGS uh, in order for them to, to receive the, the, image, uh, the imagery and then they could redistribute it. So in 2008, when there was, uh, when, when, when was this uh, change of policy, an important change of policy, uh, they have uh, discovered and they have understand that, understood that the, the segmentation of the Landsat imagery would uh, hinder true uh, progress related to making a special uh, spatial analysis on the entire archive. So in 2010, USGS launches this Landsat Global Archive Consolidation Initiative, which basically brought to one, uh, one storage uh, all the all the Landsat imagery. This is a work in progress, um, and uh, it uh, it is basically the reason why we have the possibility of um, going to a one stop shop and downloading or processing the all the Landsat uh, data for a specific for a specific region. So this is uh, this is another example related to the way that geospatial data um, went from proprietary to to the open data. And keep in mind that this is a public uh, a public funded uh, program. Um, this is um, one figure. Uh, related to the to the impact that the change of policy, uh, uh, the impact within the community as well as within the uh, the sustainability of the uh, of the of the mission, uh, it is important to to mention that since 2008, change of policy, change to open data, this change has been um, repeatedly uh, questioned. This is the reason why uh, we also have this paper from which we we extracted this figure to understand if keeping the Landsat data open is truly beneficial for the program, for the community and so on. So um, I suggest you uh, you take a look at this uh, at this um, at this paper. Um, the change of Landsat policy had important implication for the European community as well, because it has been already, uh, it had been, um, uh, it made an important impact on the decision make makers related to how Copernicus data would be given, would be um, shared with the wider community, the scientific community, the business sector, and so on and so forth. So in 2013, they have decided that all Copernicus data should be made freely available, freely accessible. Again, um, again, a public funded program that offers uh, open data as, um, as a, um, for, the, for the development of the, of the scientific community, of the business community, of the uh, public, public community. And you have here two um, to uh, to um, a short um, uh, let's say proofs of the of the um, of their decision. So we've seen what happens with in the public sector, but we do know that satellite imagery comes from commercial sector as well. Uh, so it would be interesting to see if. Um, 
if that if this paradigm if this way of of uh, of working could also function in the private sector and we do have an example in that in that direction i don't know how many uh, you know how many of you do remember that but when planet announced their uh, their initiative uh, maybe a bit naively at that point they wanted to make the all the data that they collect all the imagery they wanted to make it open data so they could spur innovation uh, more research more uh, more development fortunately the economic realities of our world didn't really uh, allow them to go into that direction. So um, this is one one example from the uh, from the private uh, private sector direction. Um, uh, that uh, since we are uh, since we are at this at this at this uh, topic, I would like to suggest if time allows you to uh, listen to a podcast that you have here on the slide talking about the uh, uh, the open data and the um, uh, the perception of the research community as well as uh, the perception of the uh, public uh, um, public sectors as well as private related to accessibility uh, of, uh, of uh, satellite imagery and uh, it's uh, it, I believe it's something that uh, we should uh, we should uh, be aware of. <laughs> okay, so we have seen an example related to what open data means with respect to the uh, public sector, making the data available for the wider community. We had a small uh, example related to what it means to the private sector. Um, the idea and the idea of our discussion today is try to understand if the open data is indeed sustainable with respect to um, um, entities and consortium like the ones that we uh, we formed for the for the geo harmonizer or even going further if it uh, if it is sustainable and how could it be sustainable for uh, anything else that is not the public sector. So what we decided was to look at other models of sustainability within this open paradigm. And as I was mentioning, open source is one. Um, I think it's obvious that open source is no longer a hobby and it, 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 is, a, it is a certified way of developing software. It is mature and it is highly used on an international scale and I'm not talking only about geospatial only about the geospatial sector. Um, and more than that, open source uh, is also a business model. And here there are just a few elements related to um, how that can and how that has been sustainable over time. Uh, during the first day of the conference, you, uh, you listened to um, uh, to Angelo Stasos, who is the director of OSGEO. OSGEO is a not-for-profit foundation founded in the United States, and its main scope is to foster geospatial software development. Um, and uh, a, a, f a flagship event for, for the OSGEO is represented by the Phosphor G. For Phosphor G, it also represents the global uh, the global conference also represents the main source of income for OSGEO. And OSGEO just uh, gathers the money and then um, gives it in uh, with uh, with clear uh, with clear um, and a transparent process to the projects within the within the foundation. All this information is available in the wiki, so everything is done in a transparent way. Another example is the R consortium that you probably uh, that you probably know of, and it uh, exactly as its name is, uh, states, it's a consortium um, meant to support the development of R uh, of the R. Um, I want to call it solution, but I <laughs> our software and um, you have also probably heard about the non focus, which is uh, also a non not for profit organization, also based in the U.S. and their uh, their main um, 
job, let's say, is to be a fiscal collector for open source for open source uh, projects. Uh, open collective has the same the same uh, the same activity, only that open collective is um, uh, is a um, is a company. And just as uh, just as an example, uh, Gital has has now joined Numfocus uh, for. Uh, um, exactly for this for this purpose to be able to uh, fund their developments and uh, to do it in a more um, you know in a, in a seamless way. Another another way of supporting the open source solutions represents the philanthropic uh, organizations and foundations. And a very good example in that direction is represented by the Ford Foundation. They have. Um, they have a, a funding initiative that is called Critical Digital Infrastructure Research, and the call uh, stands exactly for supporting the uh, open source infrastructure that is considered critical in a specific in a specific domain. Not only for not not specifically for geospatial, but uh, for the for the any for any kind of purposes. So this is this are examples of the way that open source is sustainable. Another another model that we looked at, open standards model, and um, in this in this situation, um, in this in this particular case, we looked at three uh, organization um, international standard organizations. You are most probably familiar with. Uh, with all of them, with all three, and even more, they find, they work together, they collaborate, but they have different ways of sustaining their activities. For example, ISO is an international is the international standardization organization, and they uh, offer membership only at national level. On the other hand, OGC, which is the Open Geospatial Consortium, has membership open, including for individual members. They also uh, have um, uh, development projects, uh, of course, with the related to geospatial uh, geospatial standard development, with institutions such as ESA, such as NASA, and so on and so forth. So, and the business model and the way that they sustain their activity also differs. And this is uh, this is an interesting uh, this is an interesting example as for ESO by its internal regulations sell their standards. Uh, on the other hand, uh, OGC um, uh, releases uh, as an uh, uh, under an open an open license all their all their standards. So. Uh, so far, at least for the open data and geospatial world, we have noticed till now that there are three main sources of making them making this open data initiative sustainable. And that uh, first one is related to the public funding, and we've seen the examples that we have from. Uh, from uh, the Landsat missions, from Copernicus, and you can also think of all the uh, open data initiative from the um, from the public from the public sector. You have probably used data from data.gov, for example, or other open data portals. On another on another um, another potential finance. Um, Financial supporter could uh, come from the big companies that have an interest in that open data model and that uh, in that data set. And a good example in this direction is represented by the support that Mapbox is offering to to OpenStreetMap. And another and the third uh, way of sustaining this. Uh, the open data initiative is, of course, through philanthropy, and we've seen the example from the uh, from the Ford Foundation, and there are many, many other examples when uh, philanthropy organizations support the the development of open data um, of open data sources that can uh, data sets that afterwards can be used for. Um, let's say the greater good in different in different other projects. So this is this was supposed to be a, a short introduction related to the problem that we have at hand, and uh, at this point, 
I would like to also um, remind you one more time of the Slido. Uh, oh, okay, that's great. So. On Slido, okay. So let's see. Sorry. Look on Slido. On Slido? I cannot see the question on Slido, I'm sorry. Where is it? No. Audience question and answers, but. No, she's working, she's working in front. Maybe they deleted it. Oh. Okay. No, it's, it's okay. I am. <laughs> okay. So, uh, so we, we opened the discussion. Um, let's start. Uh, you said there are some examples where the open data continues, and you mentioned the data. Can I just take that? Can I take it? We are only estimated the complexity of the uh, hybrid events. So we, we managed to find it either with the online or here, but both at the same time. So is it better now? I don't know. Okay, I'm going to check. Um, I'm going to check. Um, I'm going to check. Um, I'm going to check. 